Okay, guys, I assume you have done your little rhetorical triangle activity, and now we will finish Hillock's chapter three. Just a couple slides and a little blurb about reflection. Anyway, the subsequent steps in the process of this, of this assignment have to do with how the student writes the results of the research. And the teacher moves in a linear way through the elements of the argument she identifies on page 74. As you think about each of these steps, I want you to notice the opportunities for short lessons, call them micro lessons, on aspects of writing or mechanics. The teacher talks about indefinite and definite articles, the parallel structure, all in the context of their writing project. Here too, I think more might be done with this. Just something small like practicing another example of parallelism or writing a definition in a notebook and using the infinitive example um, that they discussed alongside a definition in a notebook. But these are um, my own preferences of the notion that any time there is an opportunity to teach a skill in context, we seize it. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a slide um, down the road. So what we read on pages 75 through 93 is an extended example of guided practice. The teacher walks the students as a class through the writing of the narrative, using their evidence as content, and offering some instruction, however undeveloped it might be, as needed about issues of style. Once they've crafted some of the writing as a class, they move to small group and then individual or independent practice. I mean, clearly, the gum chewing project is self-explanatory. And as I say, it's a model for all kinds of school-based policy tasks that you can use with students. My advice, however, is always do a quick admin check so you don't piss somebody off by questioning a school policy. However, one of the things you can say is, look, look at this great activity in my George Hillock's textbook. Hillock's a big name from the University of Chicago, and he does it with his students, and my version will meet all of the standards. And I'll also have to talk a little bit about numeracy and science as well as English language arts. Therefore, you should let me do it. Good principles will let you, shitty principles will say no, and such is life. But I do want to indicate again the way in which this project offered multiple opportunities to introduce and teach, to review, or even to reteach other more general English language arts content. And in the examples I want to share here, also note how these teachable moments emerge from the discussion. They are often unplanned. That tells you how on top of the content you must be. Not only on top of how to teach composition, not only on top of grammar, but on top of math and of science and of history. So some of the opportunities that are seized by the teacher in this lesson include the following. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about some that I think are missed. For example, on page 71 when they are devising the questionnaire, she asks, what questions must they ask? And the questions they frame are numbered one to five. Here's a chance to remind students explicitly as they try to frame questions of the five W's and H. After all, the five questions they compose include how, what, and why. It simply reinforces an invention strategy they've already learned, and questioning is the most ubiquitous of invention strategies. On page 76, the teacher raises a question about the reader of their policy. This is a moment to introduce or review the idea of audience. If she had done the rhetorical triangle, that would have already been completed. But notice she never really talks about audience. Students must learn to take time and think about the audience. Who is it? What are their concerns or interests? What might they agree with or reject out of hand? What challenges do they face? I think the teacher dropped the ball here. And the five W's and H can help with audience analysis. Who is the audience? To whom must she answer? Parents, the school board? What are her concerns? Health, money? Why did she implement the policy? Even where or when questions don't seem obvious, they might be an issue later. So it's always worth taking the time to ask them. And you must, must, must identify the audience. 
Now on page 77, the teacher does use the class discussion to offer some important instruction. <clears throat> she teaches about infinitive structure and parallelism. She also talks about definite and indefinite articles. It's a small point, but it's an important one for students to understand. And as I sort of hinted at later, I wouldn't mind seeing students open up their writer's notebooks and writing some down some definitions or some rules about parallelism. And the example they can use after the rule is right from the activity they are doing now. So when they go back to look at the rule, they'll recall the context in which they learned it. She also suggests that they consider writing that they conducted rather than did research. And her reason is that researchers use the word conducted to describe their work. I agree, but she missed a moment to connect this point with the idea of ethos or credibility. By using the language of science, the students align themselves with researchers and reveal the professional nature of their data collection. Again, it's a small moment, but it teaches the idea of ethos in a very real context. And once again, if she had completed the rhetorical triangle, even if she did it in phases, even if she just started with rhetor, audience, content and then later added ethos, logos, pathos, she would remember to address this. That's why that document is so important. Starting on page 88, the notions of concession and common ground are introduced. In arguing, we need to determine what we can concede without undercutting our point. If you recall the although because clause template, you'll remember the although clause helps to address the concession as part of the working thesis. Although we agree the gum creates a problem, we contend that your ban is causing the problem because blah, blah, blah. There's no, she never has them construct a working thesis. They don't use that kind of a model. And I believe that including that, although I contend because model during that invention stage, when they're gathering data would be incredibly helpful, not only for this task, but for future writing. In showing you these moments, my point is not that, oh my God, what a shitty teacher. No, my point is one that I will make a zillion times. Lesson planning can help you identify moments when some direct instruction in a related topic can be inserted into the learning plan, some little micro lesson. When you do that, you are teaching skills in context. But as I noted already, you have to be prepared to insert instruction on the fly. And even if you can't at the moment, if after the day's lesson is complete, you think about something you could have brought up, start there the next class. Let that be your hook or review of prior knowledge. A hook doesn't always have to be something sexy or fun or some big ass game. You can simply say, hey, last class we talked about using the word conduct, remember? Someone remind the class why we made that change. Oh, good. Now let's take a minute and look a bit more at why this is a good revision. And now you can talk about ethos. See, here's the thing. If you thought that once you completed the day's lesson, you were done and you could just turn the page, uh, no, not close. You look at it, you see what you missed, you see what might need to be reviewed, you note what you would do differently, you reflect. Every lesson ends with reflection. The business of reflection is the central part of teaching. It's determining that what we did worked in some ways and didn't work in other ways, and now we've got to figure out how we will improve it the next time. And reflection is the heart of good teaching. If you don't reflect, you will never become a great teacher. And if you need some other support for that, Let's turn to my man, John Dewey. There are so many habits or behaviors that make for a good teacher, you know, and some, you know, teachers just don't see the value in reflection. Reflection is the hardest aspect of teaching to implement. There's no template. There are no appropriate times to reflect and maybe even some questions that we could frame that would encourage reflection, well, they feel false. They ring hollow. It is 
gut-wrenching and it requires honesty. It's between you and the man in the mirror. But no greater authority than Dewey and his works are advocates of reflection. He is the I Ching of education, so his words about reflection are words to which you should adhere. Here's a little more. For those of you, by the way, who have read in Marcus's class, um, Bread Givers by Anzia Yazierska, remind me to tell you about their little, she was a student of his, and they had a little relationship. And some graduate student, after he died, was going through his desk and he found love poems to her. But I think it was like one of those, you know, asexual or whatever the phrase is, um, relationships. But it's pretty cool. Ask me about it. I've actually done a lot of work on Yazierska. She's fascinating. And this is a really cool part. She's, she's good. She was a troublemaker. I really liked her for that reason. Anyway, so take, read this a second, and then we'll move on. Anyway, my suggestion um, <clears throat> with this entire lesson is that you should always, and this teacher should always, take the time to reinforce prior skills and introduce new ones. So I think what was missing, some things I would like to have seen or consider, is to remind students that every writing task should go through the three key steps of invention, disposition, and style and that invention should result in a working thesis and an organizational or structural plan. And the rhetorical triangle sheets are simply that, a plan. And in developing paragraphs, that is disposition, I think you need to use the terms that you have taught them, claim, data, warrant, as well as ethos, logos, and pathos. And if you note at the end, Hillux accurately shows where these elements were addressed in the lesson, but they were not indicated to the student in those terms and pause as needed to offer a micro lesson, especially in terms of style. And that's what we're doing in our elements of grammar tasks, little short clipped lessons that we can insert when they fit what we are doing in the context of our larger instruction. So I need you to pay close act attention to this activity and envision how you can use it with your students. So I want you to take a second now and make a list of the individual activities that compose this lesson, okay? And I want you to identify whether they are whole class, small group, or individual. Then I want you to note what are the skills one needs to teach for each activity. And you'll note that there is a chart that you can use under course materials for week eight that will help you do this. So fill it out and bring it to me by the end of week eight. That would be by Thursday's class. Okay, cool. Thanks, you guys. See you in class this week.